Hello and welcome to the In the Tank podcast, episode 209, the podcast that explores work of think tanks across the country. As always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall, and we have quite a full house today. Uh, Joining us uh, via the internet, we have Justin Haskins, editorial director here at the Heartland Institute. Justin, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well, Donald. Um, (laughs) Take two. Take two. (laughs) Take two. (laughs) Yeah, doing great. I'm very excited about today's show. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Uh, Me too. We have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Can't wait to get into it. This time around was not nearly as good as the first (laughs) time. No, it was not. We blame Isaac, who is our other guest here. Absent for a couple of weeks, we have Isaac Orr, policy fellow at the center of the American experiment. Isaac, are you there this time? I sure am. Sweet. Mr. Kendall. How are you, sir? You haven't been here for two weeks. I missed you. Yeah, I missed all of you guys, too. Well, now we could all talk about crazy environmental extremism together again. Also joining us across the table, we have Jim Lakely, Director of Communications here at the Heartland Institute. Jim, how are you, sir? I felt better. I'm feeling a little low, a little down, a little guilty. I really think Um, I I should probably confess some things today. Yes, yes, we will get to that. I think we all can learn a thing or two and and confess a thing or two, really get it off our chest. So luckily, the uh, NBC has supplied a nice outlet for us to get our our climate sins out into the public. So we will get to that. Uh, But before we do... Jim, we have some stuff coming up at Heartland. Uh, Why don't you tell all the audience that doesn't know yet about what we've got going on? Yeah, we have a climate debate going on in Times Square at the Marriott Marquis in New York City. When's that? That is on Monday, September 23rd from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. You can watch the live stream. Just go to heartland.org and you'll be able to click on uh, an image right there on the front to get you to the live stream. But if you are this upcoming Monday, that is this upcoming Monday. And if you are in the New York City area, there is chance to get into the room. The The debate is moderated by John Stossel. It's going to be great. Um, Jay Stoss. Yes, we invited the um, the climate alarmists, let's just say it, uh, to come and debate our scientists, who are climate realists. Um, we have not gotten any alarmists to show up in person, but that does not mean that we will not be debating them, because we'll be presenting their arguments um, and uh, fairly and knock, and then debating them. So that's what the whole point of it is. We're going to be doing actually several of these, I think, over the next 12 months. And so uh, there'll be updated information on that. And, of course, on October 4th, that's uh, Friday, I think it's two weeks from now, we have our annual benefit dinner with Glenn Beck, and that's at in Palatine, Illinois, at a place called The Cotillion. You can still get tickets. You just go to heartland.org and click on Glenn Beck's face, and we hope to see you there. Fantastic. So yes, as we already kind of alluded to, we are going to be talking about quite a lot of environment topics here, circling around the idea of climate alarmism. And then assuming that we have time, which we rarely do, because I over, always overestimate the amount of time that we have, uh, we want to get into a little bit of Bernie Sanders' economic bill of rights. Uh, so we'll save that to the end. But gentlemen, uh, which has become a f- kind of a trend lately on our podcast here, the main topic of discussion has come to me like days prior to us actually recording. So we have, oh yeah, we'll talk about these things. And then yesterday, I think uh, Justin, I think it was yesterday, you brought to my attention this NBC climate confessions page that is kind of going viral. Do you want to just briefly describe what's going on here? Uh No. I want you to describe it. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. All right. Uh, So, yes, NBC has put together a nice little climate page. Andy, take him off the... Just just end his call. All right. But anyways, uh, yeah, it's going to be... Let me see here. See, you weren't prepared, were you? I was tossing it to you. All right, climate Basically, NBC nope, nope, News stop. is All trying. Right. Oh, my gosh, you're getting canceled. <laughs> Hang up on him. Climate Confessions page. So it starts off here. It says, even those who care deeply about the planet's future can slip up now and then. Tell us, where do you fall short in preventing climate change? Do you blast the AC? Do you throw <laughs> out half your lunch? Do you grill a steak every week? Share your anonymous confessions with NBC News. So then it's just basically a list of people that uh, put their confessions, most of them jokes, <laughs> on here. <laughs> it's basically like a, a, a nice little aggregate of troll jobs uh, on, the, on the environmental left, and it is a fantastic source of entertainment. So I don't know how you want to tackle this. Should we just get into it? 
one thing that I want to kind of uh, say right off the bat is, um, you know, we kind of refer to them, or at least some people in, on our side of the aisle in this topic, refer to them as like, you know, the climate cult, right? Mm-hmm. Or like the religion of, cl- of climate alarmism. This idea of having us confess our climate sins isn't really distancing, them, distancing themselves from that. Uh. <laughs> I, I didn't think, and I say this, I think I say this every other week or almost every week, just when you think that the climate crazies can't get any crazier, yeah. they keep coming in there and getting crazier. <laughs> I mean, setting up a confessional page, and, right. and, and this is done by NBC News. This is yeah. a news outlet. Right. It's not and think says, progress. No. Yeah, come on in. <laughs> confess your climate sins. Do you grill a steak every week? Oh, yeah. uh, first of all, I wish. You know, I actually try to. I aspire to do that. Um, but <laughs> if you, when you read these confessions, these people are nuts. What's actually funny is, I, ha- you know, a lot of them are, are obviously jokes. People are trolling. Oh, yeah. this dumb page by NBC uh, again. I one would of the say leading, the majority of them. are. Yeah, this is one of the <laughs> leading news outlets in the world. Right, and people are in there confessing. Oh well, you know. Uh, sometimes I don't bring a, re- uh, a reusable cup to Starbucks. Sometimes they give me a paper <laughs> one. Oh, I'm sorry. And and so you're supposed to confess these things and feel better. Yeah. You know, just that's what Twitter's for. Why do they have to set up a whole other page? Uh, Justin, do you want to contribute or do you just want to toss it to somebody else again? <laughs> <laughs> I all right. I think that what what amazed me most about this was the real confessions. Mm. The jokes are hilarious. But the fact that these people are confessing this. Now, this is like the most extremist of extreme people. I mean, if you're willing to go on to a national news website and <laughs> legitimately post a confession, like yeah. a real, like you're feeling really sad about your you're feeling yeah. really sorry and down. You're just like a pathetic person. And you're like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to publicly confess this sin that I've committed. Like these are hardcore people. Yeah. And yet even they are are totally unwilling to do just simple, basic things that the left is always telling us we have to do in order to save the planet. Right. So it's like if these people aren't even willing to do it, then what hope is there realistically to convince, I don't know, like a billion people in China or India to go (laughs) along with it too, where half the population is starving? Like, for instance, one confession on here is, I drive rather than walk, even if it's a few blocks... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's like if you really care about the planet so much that you want to take away everybody's gasoline powered car, but you're not even willing to to walk a, a few blocks. Right. Like what like what does this even mean? I mean, these people are so pathetic. I'm still <laughs> struggling to get to zero plastic in my life. Uh, Isaac, I retired early to travel, mostly on airplanes. This person's apologizing for retiring and then going on vacation. Yeah, well, they should. This is sad. This I, is um, so sad. Isaac, we, just, uh, were you on the episode when we did the breakdown of the seven-hour town hall thing, or the the whatever, the environment climate change town hall? Isaac wasn't. No. I wasn't, but I oh. did listen to it. It was a great show. You guys did a good <laughs> yeah. job. I wish I had been on it because, man, that was, but one of our, that was something. One of our biggest points uh, about that whole thing was that it was like completely working against them. It, in my opinion, it was a PR disaster for them. It was them. literally the worst thing they could have done. <laughs> right. Like, no, a debate would be too, too dicey and give up too much material to the right. Yeah. Let's make it a town hall where everybody right. is competing against themselves to out-crazy the next person. <laughs> right. And I feel like this beautiful. is the same thing. I feel like this is the same thing. Like, yeah, on one hand, you've got the complete, the, the half of the people on here just making a complete mockery, and we can get to some of those because they're hilarious. And then the other half, just like uh, Justin was saying, or like even the most diehard people are like falling short of the most minuscule steps that they could take in lowering their carbon footprint. So what's your general take on this? On the confessions? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. These are so great. (laughs) Um, Even though my partner and I largely rely on soy and insects for our protein intake, I still sneak some pieces of boiled chicken. Yeah, that that actually... Oh, my God. (laughs) That actually opens up... That opens up like a game we could play. Like, we could just read some of these off and try to determine whether or not it's a joke. Yeah, actually, I think that what is... I I can't tell if that's a joke or not. Yeah. We should play bingo, honestly. Um... (laughs) And it's funny. Uh, I just I just typed this in earlier, and uh, Google auto completed trolls. 
So Breitbart's got a, a little page that says American Heroes Troll NBC's Climate Confession <laughs> Site. Oh, sweet. I didn't read the article, but the, the headline is hilarious. Yeah, so here, let's see. I do vehicle maintenance myself and regularly pour waste oil into the city storm drains. <laughs> Is that, My is that a real one? My phase lasted literally 10 days. <laughs> is that a real one? I don't that know. one's yeah. probably real. The vegetarian thing lasting 10 days, because that's a common thing. There was some poll that like uh, that showed that people's like vegetarianism only lasts on average 30 days or something. I, I probably am exaggerating it to the plus end. Uh, a lot of these have to do with flying, people apologizing for taking airplanes. Um, says my, my, okay, is this one real? My office has three different bins for types of recycling. I have no <laughs> idea what they are for and don't care. So just mix everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like that, that might not be real in the case of somebody posting this, uh, like in a genuine manner, but it is definitely real for a lot of people in a lot of workspaces. They probably just don't go to this website and post it. Oh, what else we got here? Uh, the soy one was great. Okay, yeah, this one's my favorite. I solve global warming by turning the AC way down and leaving the windows open. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch of those, and some of them are like, and then I hop in my F-350. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyone else got any favorites? Well, yeah, I like the, um, I never recycle plastic cat food containers because they <laughs> gross me out too much to rinse. Again, is that true or is that a joke? My, my well, I just, yeah, I like how this demonstrates that people would be completely unwilling to even make small sacrifices. Yeah, right. And this would require them to pay way more for their energy, like completely reduce their standard of living, which people are, you know, not going to do. Mm -hmm. um, I just wish, can we set up, what do we say, Green New Deal Braska? Like we yeah. need to have a test plot where we just make people go live like they right like that would, and yeah it'd be great that should be a TV show I think Netflix would pick that up oh damn that would that's a great idea well, yeah what what I think this shows is that these people r really want to do these things they actually so they they embrace having the government force them to stop flying yeah and they're gonna only do it as long as they can Ooh. I guess but they are, they really are motivated by the fact that we need to all be forced to do this, 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 all this crazy stuff. Because they, obviously they could give it up voluntarily, but all these people confessing that they don't do it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that's what this is about. That's... Everybody who's confessing this is actually willing to have the government force them. Right. But I, they're not willing to do it I can't it voluntarily. voluntarily do it. I'm too so. weak. I'm too weak. But I don't uh... know. This, this one here says, I want to install solar panels. But I'm waiting for state slash federal incentives to do so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, where's this person been? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, we're uh, Justin's cutting out, but it says uh, here's another one. My sister had a has a lot of these metal straws, but I thought they were annoying, so I threw them out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, oh and then one person is just in fact the the one that's on the very first one on the page as we refreshed recording this podcast is is simply I live in the suburbs and drive most every place. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course you do, right? Because you live in the suburbs. That's right. what you have to do. You shouldn't feel guilty about that. There if you don't like it, move back into the city and you know live there. Yeah, there was something that we were talking about, especially in terms of suburbs, that uh, there uh, and that like basically like these bus lines will like only have two people in them. And it's like you really think that this is going to be environmentally conscious that we're that we're having this giant diesel bus driving around with two people right. in it. So right. um so did you guys add any yourself? Because I added uh I added <laughs> I added one. I don't think it'll get through the filter, but I said Yeah, that, mine uh, won't either. I said that um uh, that I try to limit my emissions by holding my breath. <laughs> but unfortunately, I wake up from a blackout gasping for air. <laughs> <laughs> that one will probably make it through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No derogatory language. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, actually, it's get back to the one of the original points you made there, Donnie, was that for a lot of people on the left that have leftist politics that have been soaked in leftism all the way through school and really embrace mm -hmm. it and want to live it, you know, basically 
you know, most of the people that listen to NPR or Democracy Now or things like that, these people, virtue signaling for them is paramount. Yeah. And, and climate, it is called the climate cult because it is. I mean, a confessional for crying yeah. out loud. This is a replacement for religion, and there are sacraments, and there are villains, right. and there are sinners, yes. and then there is confession. Right. You know, I mean, I was raised Catholic, and, you know, that's a... There's a lot of guilt in Catholicism. There's a lot of ritual in Catholicism. And so when I see these things from the climate cult, I, you know, I think about it in Catholic terms. Well, there's a, Catholic. there's a, yep. we were talking about this. There's a confessional prayer, yes, right? Yes. It's so, called the act of contrition. Okay. So then you went ahead and made the environmental version of this. Right? Yes. I, I, I made the climate act of contrition. <laughs> okay. And I'll share it with the audience now. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, my Gaia. I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of the earth and the pains of climate hell. Yeah. But most of all because they offend thee, my Gaia, who art good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve, with the help of Al Gore, to confess my climate sins, to do penance by giving up meat forever and taking public transportation, and to amend my recycling plan. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, after you give your confession, you have to watch uh, Inconvenient Truth like three times. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, usually when I went to confession, it's like, okay, you know, we had a, we would usually have a very long conversation. And then, yeah, you know, say 10 Hail Marys, three Our Fathers, two Acts of Contrition, right. and uh, try to be better. But now yeah, well, you have to watch funny Inconvenient Truth. Because every time something bad happens, the left is the first one to say, oh, now we just expect the right to say thoughts and prayers and not do anything about yeah. it. And that's exactly <laughs> what this is. <laughs> it's it's actually worse. It's worse because they know that they're not actually, they, they know what they should be doing and yeah. they're deliberately choosing not to do it because mm -hmm. it's inconvenient for them. Like, it's just incredible. Yeah. I don't know. It's great stuff. Man. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. Again, getting it back to force. They want, they are 100% four square behind the government forcing people to give up meat, to give up air travel, should probably maybe ration your air travel, certainly ration your meat. Kamala Harris coming straight out and saying, yeah, we should probably do that. We need to amend the dietary guidelines, which the left would be happy to make mandatory. It's all about control and taking away your choice. Look, I don't. I, I live a pretty green life, but not for any other reason than it's convenient for me or I feel like it. And you shouldn't have to have the government forcing you to p go into public transportation instead of using your car, um, to stop buying steaks. You know, I love steaks, <laughs> and I think it's great. Um, and But these people basically want to reduce those kinds of consumption. When you are guilty about boiling the occasional chicken, <laughs> oh, man. you are very, very far gone. <laughs> yeah, but so, but some of these people, but that's the thing. Some There's so many different kinds of personalities here, right? Like there's the person who feels guilty about boiling chicken. There's the person who feels guilty about taking a vacation. There's a person who feels guilty about commuting to work to their job to be productive members of society. There's all kinds of people. But then there are, the, like I said, there are the people who they could easily change this about themselves, but they're totally unwilling to do it. Like, I use enough Q-tips for a family of eight. <laughs> I have an addiction to them in hygiene purposes, makeup application, even cleaning. It's like you can't even give up your Q-tips. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? like, what is the – like, how committed are you to right. this? Like, like, this is – it's just – it's amazing. There are so many – there are so many elements to this. I think we could probably talk about it all day. I mean, there really are just amazing. It's it, psychologically, this is this deserves like a whole study in and of itself of the psychology of the kind of person who would go on here and confess their climate change sins and the psychology of the kind of people who would build this whole system in the first place because mm -hmm. they think this is a good idea. They they need a psych evaluation just in and of themselves. Right. Uh, but this just this just makes them all just like what Donnie said earlier. This makes them look so bad. This in combination with the seven hour climate change marathon in combination of all of the fear mongering that they're doing. I just don't think that any of this, this, this might work in, 
you know, liberal New England and it might work in California or whatever. But is this going to play in like Youngstown, Ohio or Wisconsin or something like that? I don't think so. I I, I think that people look at this from those places and think that these people are totally nuts. And yet those are the people I hate to break it to you, Democrats, but those are the people you need to convince in order to win in 2020. And they still just have not figured that out yet. Yeah, I was waiting to see like, uh, you know, scrolling through this to see if there was a confession that was like, you know, I, I confess to bringing in three new carbon dioxide emitters. Society forces me to call them children. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah, let's let's get past the whole Starbucks thing and, and using certain types of light bulbs like the real solutions that are being proposed to, to fix climate change, quote unquote, are a lot more drastic than these things that these people are uh, uh, are confessing to. If you think grilling a steak in your backyard, one of the people said, you know, we try not to grill so much, maybe only once a week. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I mean, if you really think that you grilling a steak in the backyard um, for yourself and your family um, is is doing such damage to the planet that we can't, you know, that that our human race will not survive... You have a mental problem. You you really do have a mental problem, and you really should, should go see somebody about it. Yeah, because well, that's insanity. That's there, insane talk. Is there a term for you know? Because we have like Trump derangement syndrome, right? Like TDS, people that are just ballistic when it comes to anything regarding Trump. Is there a I, term I just, for that? Like climate cha- climate alarmism induced insanity or something? <laughs> Can we coin that? I just think it's climate hypochondria. Okay. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. Climate hypochondria. All right. Yeah. Like people are just inventing things to feel bad about. <laughs> uh, like at my health club, you know, we got a we got an email notice that um, they used to have little plastic cups by the, uh, uh, you know, the water uh, the water coolers, sure. right? Yeah. And then they said, uh, you know, starting at the starting September first, um, we're going to be removing all the plastic cups, and you have to bring your own plastic bottle um, to hmm. fill it up. You know. For drinking when working out and bring a new plastic bottle every right, day. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, I've had to adjust. I've had to remember to bring one. You know, fortunately, I usually have three or four empty ones in my car on the floor, so I'll bring those in in a pinch. Um, but um, what was funny is I saw another sign that went up at the health club because they also have free coffee and so they have little coffee cups. Mm-hmm. So they had to put up a whole sign that says, a reminder that the coffee cups are only for coffee and not for water. Please remember to bring your water bottle. <laughs> oh, unintended consequences we've got going on here? Yes. Yeah, so when people had their own choice, people would try to get around it. So uh, I thought that was hilarious. I, I I was not smart enough to think, hey, just grab one of those coffee cups yeah. and put water in it and drink it. There was, you know? one, there was one that was like, oh, I use K-cups all of the time, but I use a reusable mug. Yeah. It's like, wait, do people not use re- reusable mugs? Is that a thing? Yeah. Well, <laughs> ugh. I mean, cake cup coffee. I just is smash terrible anyway. ceramic after every cup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just smash it on the ground. <laughs> I don't. I don't like to clean. I'm trying to save water, so I, I just smash spike it, it like I scored a touchdown. Finish that cup. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh oh uh, yeah i mean what do they have like styrofoam cups like their own styrofoam cups at home yeah. that they're drinking out of that like right. i can't i Who can't even think it can't be paper it's like burn your hand <laughs> so what one could of, it possibly uh, be yeah one of my confessions was i uh i burn tires in my home to stay warm <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, this has been climate hysteria week, really, because, you know, yeah. uh, Greta Thunberg, or I think that's... Thornberg. Thornberg, whatever. Greta. No, that's the wild thornberry. Yeah. St. Greta, basically. Actually, yeah, somebody, Greta. somebody actually compared Sarah her to Silverman. Jesus. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, or Joan of Arc, yeah. Sarah yeah. Silverman, yeah. So, yeah, this, this, this secular St. Greta has been in the United States all week doing the media rounds. She's going to be addressing... She, I think she addressed Congress this week. She's going to be addressing the United Nations. Mm. Everybody is just worshipping this 16-year-old girl. And, uh, yeah, so this has just been... Yeah, climate hysteria turned up to eleven for days well, and days on end. I, I got to give it to some of our youth in this country that are using this as an excuse to have a uh, education strike yeah. and leaving. Like I could be the most like me as I am right now, per, like in school, you know, in high school or whatever, and I would totally use this as an excuse to leave. Like, oh, there's yeah. no doubt about it. Half the kids, I are... would take the whole week off <laughs> yeah. for climate change. Right. Right. Maybe the whole month. Yeah, every Friday. How about that? Yeah, <laughs> about the greenest Friday. thing I can do is stay home and not leave my house. Yeah. That's the greenest thing I can do. Right. Yeah, half the kids who took off for the climate strike today are playing video games at home. No doubt. Or at the movies. Good right. for right. them. Sure. Driving yeah, around. good for them. I agree. Drive Burn around, in that sweet, sweet coal to play their <laughs> Nintendo. <laughs> right. 
Um, so another thing that was kind of going around, I guess you can kind of consider this viral or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but it was from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and it's wrong again. 50 years of failed echo apocalyptic predictions. And uh, so I printed it out here. And, and what is, we, we've covered kind of this before, like on Earth Day, I think. We've had like kind of the failed apocalyptic predictions that didn't come true. Uh, the difference between that and this is this one seems a little more fleshed out. And the document uh, contains a whole bunch of printed out articles like from the actual New York Times, LA Times, uh, Time Magazine, The Guardian, all across all across the world. And uh, so there's some pretty good stuff in here. It says, what follows is a collection of notably wild predictions from notable people in government and science. And of course, we have our friend Paul Ehrlich is found throughout this whole thing. He's got some crazy predictions all over the place. Um, and maybe we can get into a couple of these and if you guys have uh, some kind of favorites to pull out here. But... One of the things that kind of caught my attention, and we did kind of briefly cover this when we did the Earth Day version of this, but it was very apparent when looking through the first several pages of this document, is that during the 70s, during the whole course of the 70s, from basically the 70 to like, you know, 80, they were really concerned about global cooling. And that was a little bit kind of... Not, I guess not shocking because I kind of knew it, but the extent of it, I was, I guess I was unaware of. And the idea that like they turned from fear about global cooling to global warming, like within 10 years, just makes you think that what's, what's going to happen 10 years from now? Are they going to go back to worrying about global cooling? I'm not really sure. No, I mean, but probably, or maybe it'll be something else. Maybe right. it's the bees. Maybe it's, well, you know, it's maybe it's acid rain will too. come back. Who knows? <laughs> it, it'll be CO2 induced global cooling. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Maybe. I don't know. Well, these are the same people. Actually, back in this, because it's often, people on our side of this debate often bring up the fact that, yeah, they predicted ice ages back in the 70s. Yeah. And the environmental left says that's fake news. They said that's not true. Um, they say that's, that's, that's totally not true. Of course. So this study by CEI um, showing all these examples. I mean, here's one. Thursday, April 16th, 1970. Scientists predicts new ice age by 21st century. Mm -hmm. And that was in the Boston Globe. Um, you know, again, we could even just spick or skip all of the um, Paul Ehrlich ones. Right. You know, here's another one. Washington Post. Uh, U.S. scientist sees new ice age coming. That was from uh, July 9th, 1971. So these things, you know, it, it is true that they predicted a, um, uh, an ice age coming, but their solution to everything, whether it's an ice age or we're all going to, we're boiling the planet, is always more control, more control over the economy, more control over you. Government will fix it. Government will have to take over all these things, or else we're all going to die, no matter what it is. Yeah, the I mean, solution's always the same. Right. We've got NASA and Columbia University scientists saying that uh, we're going to have an ice age coming in the next 50 years. Uh, Justin, you and I were just talking about this. What were some uh, things that were kind of standing out to you in this document? Uh, so one, some of the things that stood out to me were the ones that made, I, I like the ones that make specific predictions about specific periods of time, mm -hmm. uh, because often what you see now is they, they might make specific predictions, but they're always like 80 years off into the future. And so yep. most people around today will be dead by the time we actually, you know, but by the time these, these timelines actually come to fruition, but back in the 1970s and eighties, they weren't as concerned about that. So they were making predictions in the future that we would actually live to see. Yeah. So one, one for instance is 1988, uh, James Hansen, our buddy, James Hansen, a NASA scientist says that, uh, by 2050, which obviously hasn't happened yet. Um, the temperatures will be six to seven degrees higher than they are today, which nobody <laughs> believes is going to happen by 2050 now. <laughs> and, um, that the level of the ocean will rise anywhere from one to six feet by that period of time, which is only 30 years away. And in addition to that, that Washington DC would go from its current 35 days a year with over 90 degrees of temperature to 85 days a year. So almost three months out of the year in Washington, DC, they're going to have temperatures that are 90 degrees or higher. Now we haven't obviously reached 2050 yet. That's uh, like I said, it's 30 years away, but we can look at the temperatures in Washington, D.C. and see what's been going on. And it's actually been completely in decline over the past 100 years, the number of days with temperatures above 90 degrees. So it's been trending downward, including in the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so 
it's not going to happen. There's just absolutely no chance that it's going to happen. There was another one in here that predicted that snowfalls are now going to be a thing of the past. This was in March 20th, 2000. Dr. David Viner at the Climactic Research Unit of the University of East Anglia, which is a very influential uh, group, by the way, in climate science, said that within a few years, within a few years, winter snowfall will become, quote, a very rare and exciting thing. Children just aren't going to know what snow is. <laughs> That's within a few years yeah. of 2000. I mean, some of this stuff is just, it's totally crazy. Uh, there's obviously the Al Gore stuff. Uh, Prince Charles says just 96 months to save the world. That was in 2009. Um, you know, obviously there's all kinds of uh, Al Gore predictions and that, that sort of thing. But it really, it really blew me away how many of these predictions were very specific and never actually came even close to happening. Sometimes the opposite happened. And yet these same people in the same organizations are being taken seriously now as though they can predict something 60, 70, 80 years into the future when they were getting 20 year predictions horribly wrong. Yeah. I mean, that that to me should be the takeaway. If you can't predict climate in 20 years or 30 years, how are you going to predict it 80 years into the future? Isaac, what you got? I want Paul Ehrlich to come on the show. <laughs> yeah. I think what it'd be really him? fun what would you just ask to him? quiz him. If we had him on there, what would be the first couple of questions that you would want to pitch to him? Like, how are you still employed and how do I get a job <laughs> where I can be wrong every single time but still get trotted out as some sort of expert? Yeah. You could ask us, why didn't you want me to be born? Yeah, right. Oh, <laughs> yes. I got to find that one. Thank you for reminding yeah. me. But one that I, I, I do have pulled up here is uh, talking about the threat to islands. So this was an article from 1988 talking about how within the next 30 years, so that would be uh, from 1988 to last year, the level of sea rising is threatening to cover completely some Indian Ocean nation of the Maldives. Maldives? Maldives. Okay. Maldives. So I Googled Maldives because, you know, it's not like I'm keeping tabs on what's going on there. So I just Googled it, hit news, and uh, here's the first two stories that pop up. Okay, We're still here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, five days in the Maldives on a budget of under 1700 whatever their currency is. Yes, you can. And then uh, Sushmita Sen leaves Maldives gasping for breath in bikini top and <laughs> miniskirt. So it doesn't seem like they're really uh, struggling to stay above water. Sounds pretty amazing, yeah. actually. <laughs> it sounds great. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite predictions, uh, uh, Justin, with, your, with our buddy Jim, uh, Jim Hansen, again, there's another one in this study, uh, a, a salon reporter in, 20, in 2001 wrote a story about how when he met Jim Hansen for the first time in 1988, they were in New York City, and they were um, driving. And he said, quote, I went over to the window with Hansen and, and looked out on Broadway in New York City and said, if what you're saying about the greenhouse effect is true, is there anything that's going to look different down there in 20 years? Mm -hmm. And uh, Hansen told him, the West Side Highway, which runs along the Hudson River, will be underwater. Is it? It is not underwater, oh, and right. but he said it would have been underwater by this year. <laughs> okay, so, so no, it's not underwater. Well, they so still got another, a couple months, right? <laughs> yeah, it's so it, it's 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 awesome that these things are on the record. And congrats to CEI. We are this is the In the Tank podcast, the Think Tank CEI for pulling all these things together. Wait, okay, so you mentioned the idea of you know why didn't you want me to be born or whatever? Right. So this is an article from the Salt Lake Tribune, November seventeenth, nineteen sixty seven, titled a "Dire Famine Forecasted by." Uh, 90, uh, by 75, right? And so it says, it is already too late for the world to avoid a long period of famine, a Stanford University biologist said Thursday. Paul Ehrlich said that the time of famines is upon us and will be at its worst, the most disastrous by 1975. He said the population of the United States is already too big that birth control may have to be accomplished by making it involuntary and by putting sterilizing agents into the staple foods and drinking waters, and that the Roman Catholic Church should be pressured into going along with the routine measures of population control. Wow. That is in 1967. That is absolutely terrifying to me. Anyone that has listened to this podcast for a while knows that my concerns about population control are probably more than the average person. But this stuff right here scares me to no end. 
Yeah, he also had another prediction in there. You mentioned the 1975 one, the same exact interview. It says that Ehrlich said experts keep saying the world food supply will have to be tripled to feed the six or seven billion people they expect to be living in the year 2000. And then Ehrlich says that may be possible theoretically, but it is clear that it is totally impossible in practice. That was 20 years ago, folks, (laughs) and people are still alive and well. But he said it was impossible and that it was clear right. that it was impossible and that it was only theoretical that we could feed six or seven billion people. We have more than seven billion people and we're feeding most of them just fine. Yeah. Well, so this is this, it's, it's just nuts. How does anybody take this guy seriously? <laughs> and that's with well, Americans throwing half their food away, you know, <laughs> which is one of the climate sins that right, was confessed. Right. Um, exactly. Well, yeah. And fewer people are going hungry than there were in the 1960s, too. So. That's all part of in this. terms of popular in, in terms of percentage. That's right. Yes, right. For percentage sure. of Absolutely. people in hunger. Yeah, hunger is getting has gotten better. Are are we are almost every year breaking global crop records? Almost every single year. Yep. So how is it possible? I mean, it just doesn't fit. This guy was so wrong on so many levels. He also had wasn't he the one that had the prediction in 1969 too? The the cloud of death or whatever oh, it was. Sure, I think yeah. he was. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he had a, he had a prediction in 1969 that was talking about basically, uh, pollution. The title of the article was in the New York times. It says the foe of pollution, foe of pollution sees lack of time. So I guess Ehrlich is the foe of pollution. <laughs> and he says here, we must realize that unless we are extremely lucky, everybody, not just some people, Everybody will disappear in a cloud of blue steam <laughs> in 20 years. 20 years. That, that was like 1969. A, that sounds like a Stephen King story or something like that. <laughs> what was that supposed to be? The blue I steam. Know. I guess pollution. I guess it's just pollution. Uh, it doesn't say anywhere in here. I guess we're just supposed to know that that's pollution. Well, here here's the thing that'll slightly transition us to the kind of a something similar. But there there's another prediction in here that's talking about. Uh, these two scientists that went to basically present some of their ideas in front of Congress or the White House. Uh, this is in the 70s, talking about global cooling. But it says uh, in, in 1974, Snyder and Bryson, the two scientists, tried to explain to the White House policymaking group why uh, conditions are likely to worsen. One of the most dispress- depressing anecdotes in the book in Schneider's description of the tone uh, the the deaf ear their warnings received right okay so they went to the the White House and uh, basically they just were ignored and basically and, and that was a horrible thing and it was like okay that kind of sounds familiar that's like the the sim- same thing that's going on right now they're chanting this alarmism and you know people on our side are just basically ignoring and ridiculing them like we were doing right now right <laughs> so but it was just thinking <clears throat> like thank goodness they were ignored in the 70s because could you imagine if everybody was in full support of doing something not only would we be running in the wrong direction because we were fearing cooling there but if we took some of the more drastic measures into consideration and actually pursued some of these population control measures and stuff like that It'd be a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. The The other thing, too, that I think we should highlight is that this is not all just like one off scientists. OK, like Paul Ehrlich and people like that. Some of these people are associated with not just academic institutions, but with actual government agencies. Yeah. And they're in some cases whole government agencies, like whole committees and stuff that were part of government agencies were making these appeals. There's one in here, one article that's mentioned in this uh, CEI article that says this was in 1989. It was an Associated Press story. A a, uh, United Nations environmental official says that entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. Right. You know, so I mean, these things have been it's been going on well, forever. It's been all sorts of different committees and government agencies and and scientists at the highest level making these claims. And they've been wrong for 50, 60, 70 years in some cases. So, and many of these people are still making predictions now or the pe- or they're the people who taught the next generation yeah. of climate scientists who are making predictions. So there's this E&E plan that uh, that they were responding to, like a New York Times op ed that was basically saying, like, OK, uh, Mitch McConnell, you don't care about uh, or you think our plan for combating climate change is bad. What's your plan? 
And this E and E, they produce this piece basically saying that like the best plan is to do nothing. Right. And I am curious, and they, you know, they outline kind of their reasons why, and some of them kind of compare with uh, our top five list that we talked about, where, you know, uh, cutting emissions won't have any effect on the climate, how if the U.S. were to reduce their emissions to zero, you still got China that's pumping out all of this, Um, the claim, oh, that there has been no reductions at a national or a, a worldwide level. And uh, that CO2 is necessary for life on Earth and uh, that basically pointlessly wrecking the U.S. economy is bad politics. But so I guess I kind of answered the question already. Um, You know, if we did take this drastic action back in the 70s, it would have been horrible, obviously, and all for nothing. So is that kind of the same thing that we should do now? Should we should we kind of go along with this E&E idea and say, no, we shouldn't do anything? Or should we kind of go the path of that Matt Gates and produce a alternative solution to dealing with this? Uh, Isaac, I'm going to you first. Well, uh, in order to actually affect some real change in terms of other countries emitting CO2, you need to give them an alternative that's better than burning coal or natural gas. Right. And wind and solar ain't ever going to be that. <laughs> yes. So if you actually wanted to sit down and figure out, okay, well, if you do think that this is an existential crisis, you need to stop throwing money down the toilet on these sources of energy that just don't work. You'd be pumping all kinds of cash into nuclear research because – Theoretically, it's got a lot higher energy density. It does have a lot higher energy density than coal or natural gas. It's the only thing that could beat it in terms of price. So like, you have to actually just start selling in a real market instead Mm of uh, trying to just, I don't know, policy dictate your way into some sort of, you know, quote unquote solution. Yeah, I mean, but there is a little bit of a, um, there's a little part of me that wants to say, all right, you know, climate alarmists, obviously your solutions don't work, and I can spell out the reasons why your your solutions don't work. If you really are fearful about this, why don't you pursue this idea? Jim, do you think there's any, like, reason why we would pursue anything like that, or is it all for nothing? It's all for nothing. There's no reason to pursue any plan. The idea that human any activity or lack of activity or directed activity by human beings can affect the climate uh, of the Earth now, 10 years from now, a century from now or two centuries from now, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It is hubris. Even the United Nations, even with the Paris Climate Accord, the the supporting materials for why we need the Paris Climate Accord, actually admits that the difference between doing absolutely everything that Paris outlines that human beings must do to to reduce the rise of temperatures by only 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, um, the difference between doing nothing and doing everything they say is so insignificant that it can't even really be accurately measured. It's something like uh, a fraction of a degree, maybe f- three-tenths or even three-hundredths of a degree. It is completely useless. And they don't ever highlight this, but people need to remember it. We cannot control the climate. Not the CO2 is not some kind of magic thermostat that if we reduce our, ca- our carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere, we will not warm up. And if we continue doing what we're doing, we're going to warm up exponentially. That's not how, that's not how it works. That's not, how, that's, that's not how carbon dioxide works as a greenhouse gas. It's, it has diminishing power as a, as a greenhouse gas. The more you put into the atmosphere, we we're already pretty much at the top of this parabolic uh, curve as far as CO2 uh, retaining heat in the atmosphere. It's all for nothing. And so don't do anything. It's actually the smartest thing to do because it will keep people healthier, keep people happier, and it will keep uh, um, you know, poor people rising up out of poverty, especially in the developing world. Well, Justin, so, I mean, do you think there is any benefit in trying to convince people that are really alarmed about climate change to maybe embrace ideas of, like, opening the door to more nuclear power or maybe concentrating on adaptation rather than fruitless mitigation? Uh, So there are a couple of interesting parts of this conversation. The The first, I think, is that in some ways what Isaac said is, is maybe the most important thing because you have to create it. You you can create a, uh, you can make an argument 
that says you need to embrace nuclear power because that's much more realistic here in the United States for us to adopt nuclear power than wind and solar. And maybe you can convince people here in the United States to do that. Like maybe you could actually convince the left to do that. You probably can't, but maybe you could. But it's not going to really matter unless you make it much cheaper because the rest of the world is not going to do it. So the, the major countries that we need to be concerned about, like India and China, they're not going to do that if it's more expensive. If it's the same, then they'll do it. If it's maybe a little bit more, they might consider it. But they're not going to do it unless it's much more affordable. So you have to – so I don't even know that convincing them really makes any sense because why should we pay more for our energy – to reduce CO2 emissions, even if CO2 emissions are causing the problem, it's not going to make any difference because the rest of the world isn't going to do it. So you have to make it more affordable if you're if, to even make that a viable option mm -hmm. for the rest of the world. So that's really important. That's the well, that's the yeah. Go ahead, Isaac. Yeah, I mean, today has proven that even people that you know claim to care a lot about this right. aren't going to walk instead exactly. of taking their car to the store <laughs> right exactly so, they're not going to pay they're not going to pay more money so you have to make it affordable i saw one poll it was like 50 it was like 45 percent or something like that of the people polled said they wouldn't pay one dollar extra a month not yeah. one dollar Yep. Or to, to battle climate change. So, I mean, so, so that's the thing, right? You have to make it an affordable option it, even, to convince those people. You're never going to convince them. What Jim is saying right now, you're never going to convince them of that. Forget that. That's not even an option. Mm -hmm. They're never going to believe that. Uh, so I think realistically, you would want to convince them to do things that allow private industry, opening up the energy industry so that pro so consumers have more freedom in the energy industry. And so that the energy industry is innovative and producing new technologies and making energy more affordable. I think you could sell that to them in certain ways. I think that the other thing, though, um, maybe the, the most important thing that we can do to the other side is convince them that the best course of action is actually to start get, – get rid of our deficit yeah. and start saving money sure. in case something does happen. And right. then you have the benefit of saying, well, even if you don't think that there's going to be some climate catastrophe, if there's some other catastrophe, we have some money sitting around. So to me, that makes much more sense. Instead of trying to throw money at a problem that you're not going to solve because India and China are never going to go along with us, why not just save the money and then deal with whatever the effects of climate change might be in the future if they do happen to, to, to exist? Because I'm not as confident as Jim is that – Nothing will happen in the future if we increase CO2. I don't know. I have no clue. And I don't. And to be honest, I don't really think most scientists actually know. I think that no one can predict anything that's going to happen uh, in the future when it comes to climate. And so for me, I think whether it's climate or whether it's uh, you know any other sort of natural disaster that might happen, I think we should have money sitting around in case something does happen so that we can deal with the effects of that. But that ain't going to happen while we're running trillion-dollar deficits <laughs> right. and we have $22 trillion in debt. Uh, we are going to get to Bernie Sanders' uh, Economic Bill of Rights. Isaac, uh, you have to get out of here, don't you? I sure do, but I would like to thank my uh, my newest LinkedIn connection, Mrs. Kendall, for the uh, <laughs> uh, Johnny's the mom? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's... yeah. <laughs> yeah, Donnie's yeah. mom, I'm I'm her favorite too. That's probably true. That's probably true. All right, Isaac, so long. See you later. All right. Yep. See ya. All right. Let's move on uh, to our last topic of discussion, which is the concept of the second bill of rights, or the economic bill of rights, or the idea of positive rights. So I have in front of me a couple of responses, but the responses to what you would ask, and that is Bernie Sanders. He's got on his main website, Sanders calls for 21st century a bill of rights. So you print this out and it turns out to be like 10 pages and nine pages is just socialist and identity politics drivel. So I won't uh, let you suffer through that. It just goes on and on and on and on. Um, but he eventually gets to his point. Um, and uh, so here it says, while the bill of rights protects us from the tyranny of an impressive a uh, oppressive government, many in the establishment would like the American people to submit to the tyranny of oligarchs, multinational corporations, Wall Street banks, and billionaires. He says, in 1944, FDR proposed an economic bill of rights 
but died a year later and was never able to fulfill that vision. Our job, 75 years later, is to complete what Roosevelt started. That is why today I am proposing a 21st century economic bill of rights, a bill of rights that uh, establishes once and for all that every American, regardless of his or her income, uh, is entitled to um, the right. So I just I guess I'll just list these off the right to a decent job that pays a living wage, the right to quality health care, the right to complete education, the right to affordable housing and the right to clean environment and a clean return. Uh, and a secure retirement. So, I mean, we can just kind of go through these uh, before we get to the core concept of positive rights versus negative rights or natural rights. And uh, so it says regardless of his or her income, so keep that in mind for some of these, but it says, number one, the right to a decent job that pays a living wage. Uh, Define decent. What's a decent job, Jim? A decent job is one that a person voluntarily takes enjoys and considers worth his time (laughs) okay so you know just like you know somebody that has to like just dig out trash or something like that well well, here's 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 a fact for everybody who doesn't know this that doesn't have any experience in the real world not every job is decent and fun (laughs) that's my point and that's my point yeah i mean (laughs) those those ditches don't dig themselves (laughs) uh the right to quality health care so my concern on this one is that if, like, you know, let's say we nationalize the healthcare industry and then it goes the way of every government uh, uh, program ever and starts to decline in quality, can we then sue the government for non quality healthcare? Like, if this is a human right and we pass Bernie Sanders' economic bill of rights, can we sue the government if they don't supply us quality healthcare? I suppose. Yes. Yes, we could. Right. The answer is yes. You absolutely <laughs> could. The next one the right to a complete education. So define complete. Does that mean high school? Does that mean college? Does that mean a master's program? Does that mean everybody has the right to get a doctorate? Probably. It means five <laughs> doctorates. <laughs> right. No, I mean, why wouldn't it? You never can stop learning, right? Right. So you have the... What Lifetime if learner. What if there's something... <laughs> what if there's something that you could only learn from one specific person? Like, can I <laughs> buy Bernie's decu- uh, de- <laughs> economic bill of rights? Do I have the right to be taught culinary artistry by Wolfgang Puck? Yes. <laughs> yes. Next question. <laughs> yes. Next question. Move on. Without, without question. <laughs> if you want to make pizza just like Wolfgang, then yeah. Right. You don't have a choice. Yeah. You have to go to him. Uh, yeah, there's no question about the, it. The government. Gordon can- Ramsay, like, has to teach me the finer points of uh, how to make a. Uh, you know, some type of fine, fine dining meal. No, no, no. Tofu, something, whatever it is. It's going to be vegan. So, yeah. <laughs> I want question. LeBron James to teach me how to dunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to work out great. I don't, I don't think, the, I don't think, I think I'm going to be learning that lesson for a long, right. long time. <laughs> yeah. The, hope, your, hope your schedule's free. It's going to be a while. <laughs> the right to affordable housing. So keep this in mind. He says that every American, regardless of his or her income, has the right to affordable housing. So if I have no income, What's affordable to me? A free house. So does that everyone get us a free house? Is that what he's proposing here? Yes, a free place to live. I suppose we did that. We tried that. We actually we tried that back in the uh, seventies and eighties by building housing projects. Enormous. Um, apartment That's true. buildings with hundreds and hundreds of yeah. It doesn't in say them. decent housing; no. it just says affordable. affordable so it housing. could be like right, and that, <laughs> and that worked point. out so great. All of those big projects have pretty much been bulldozed since. But yeah, yeah, let's do that again, Bernie. The the right to a clean environment. Now, this seems like probably the most like innocuous term, but what's funny about that is like it comes along with probably the most authoritarian. Uh, constraints. You know, if you read into uh, the Green New Deal or listen to the show where we talk about it, so so that's his uh, that's his Bill of Rights. All of these things, uh, Jim. You know, are you, why are you so heartless that you would be against this? Because um, those aren't rights at all. All of the things listed there are commodities or promises or something, but they are not rights. I, you actually don't have a right to a clean environment. Um, yeah, you, you don't have a right to housing. You don't have a right to healthcare. You don't have a right to any of that stuff. Yeah, um, th- those are all services that the government may provide, and uh, you may elect people that want to give those things to you. Um, and you should be honest and upfront about it. Those are not rights. Those are things. Those are commodities. Those are services. Yeah. And there's a big, big difference between that and and a right, which is what is actually in our constitution. Right. Yeah. You know, I, w- I 
I was thinking about this. Like, if you really boil this down, like, let's just the most simplistic example of this idea of positive and, and negative rights, right? So if there's an island and there's two people on it, me and you, okay, you happen to have an umbrella. Whatever plane that we fell out of, you <laughs> were holding on to your umbrella, right? Of course. So I it never start- go anywhere without it. <laughs> so it starts raining. You have an umbrella. I don't suddenly have a right to your umbrella because it's raining. No, you, that's, that's correct. It's your property. Yes. Now, you, you don't, <laughs> and you actually don't even have a right to grab a rock, hit me in the head, and take my umbrella. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> right. You do have a right, as with free speech in our little tiny island utopia, I would award, we would agree to that uh, free speech should be included. So you have a right to try to convince yes. me to share my umbrella with Precisely. you. Precisely. And um, the, I'll just tell you right now the answer is no. <laughs> Well, thank you for your charity. Um, so I've got a couple of pieces. That we, we're running out of time, so I won't be able to get into most of it. But uh, there was a couple of pieces that were posted on FEE, which is the Foundation for Economic Education. One of them is particularly interesting and is authored by Clarence Carson and is an article from 1962. And he's referring to these concepts of Franklin, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and his economic bill of rights, and uh, there, you know, he basically breaks down why or the difference between natural and arbitrary rights, and basically how natural rights is just what the government can't take from you, right? They have to leave you alone. This is all of the things that are just like you are born with the rights to the the things that are outlined in the bill of rights, stuff like that. Um, Positive rights, or arbitrary rights, as he points out, is things that you would need to take somebody else's fruits of labor and able to accomplish. So a couple of the examples that he has here. He says, uh, does every child have the right to an education? I mean, uh, obviously Bernie Sanders would say yes. He says, if so, it must mean that he has a claim upon someone to educate him. For a right to be viable, it must be realizable. Education requires a teacher. A teacher must come forth willingly, or one must be procured by inducements or coercion. In practice, the problem is one of employing teachers and paying them for their services. The money for payment must be willingly given, or it must be extracted from those who have to... uh, uh, who have it by force or threat of force. In either case, however, for the child to have the right to an education means that he has the right to the fruits of the labor of others. And he goes through and kind of talks about this in terms of wages and a couple of other different examples. But, I mean, that's that's the big difference here. If you have the right to somebody else's labor, that's not a right. It's something that you want. Justin? Well, if it is if it is a right, then what it means is that the other person doesn't have a right to control their labor, which is effectively makes them to some degree a slave. Yes. Which is which is exactly what socialism is. I mean, that's that's what socialism is. Basically, it's everybody in society must contribute what they can contribute. They have no choice. They must work the jobs that they that they need to be worked they must contribute what they need to contribute in order to give to those people that are perceived to have some kind of need and that's the whole that's the whole basis of socialism so what that means is you don't have control over your own labor and so that's why you always see these socialist societies descend into chaos because when people don't have control over their own labor they don't work that hard because they don't have any reason to because at the end of the day, they end up with the same amount of wealth, roughly speaking, as everybody else in society. And if you start paying them more money to incentivize them, well, now you have a, a, a borderline capitalist society, right? You're now incentivizing people with wealth. So you can't do that. So what do you do? You, you either force them to do it using guns and tanks and missiles and stuff like that, which is usually how it goes, and gulags. Uh, you force people to do it, or the whole thing comes crumbling down. And that it's it's always one of those two things, usually a combination of those two things. But this is why socialism never works, because you can promise people things all you want. But in the end, if you can't if if require if 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 the only way to provide it is to force people to violate their beliefs in some fashion or to force people to give up their other rights, then that means that your society is going to fall apart. And in fact, we saw this in the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union's constitution, it, in its actual constitution, the highest law of the Soviet land promised all of these exact same things, mm-hmm. all of them. 
I mean, th- th- it's amazing. It's it's like the wording is even kind of similar in some cases. <laughs> Article 40 of the so- Soviet Union Constitution. Citizens of the USR have the right to work. That is to guaranteed employment and pay in accordance with the quantity of their work and not below the state established minimum. Okay. Citizens of the USSR have the right to health protection. This right is ensured by free qualified medical care provided by state health institutions. Citizens of the USR have the right to maintenance in old age, in sickness, and in the event of complete or partial disability in or loss of the breadwinner. Citizens of the USR have the USSR have the right to housing. The right is ensured by the development and upkeep of state housing. <laughs> Citizens of the USSR have the right to education, mm. ensured by the free provision of all forms yeah. of education all by the institution. Very familiar. Universal. It's every single thing. <laughs> yeah. There's every single thing. There's even a right in here to. Uh, there's even something in here about protecting the environment. I mean, literally everything. So, everything that Bernie Sanders wants was provided by the Soviet Union, or or was promised by the Soviet Union. Yet, why did the Soviet Union then fall apart? Why weren't they providing these rights? Yeah. How did people in, in end this, up in gulags? Exactly, because that has to. That's the way it always ends up when you try to provide people with all of these things, because you're forcing people, in effect, into in a, to some form of slavery, because you're making them work. You're 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 making them work for other people to other people's benefits, and you're not requiring those people to work. And if you require everybody to work, which I suppose you could do, you basically have an authoritarian regime in place. I, I of course, Bernie Sanders honeymooned in the Soviet Union, yeah. so I guess we, we're we're now quite certain what his most cherished souvenir from that honeymoon is. <laughs> it's the Soviet Constitution. Yeah, he's like, oh, maybe we should just adopt this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, look, the, the history of humankind, going back uh, millennia, is one of Misery, oppression, totalitarianism, and uh, you know, death and destruction, yeah, and yeah. and slavery. That um, it just is. the The American experiment um, is a rare, and especially in the timeline of humanity and civilization, a very rare and short so far deviation from that natural state of man, which is to oppress his other man. And, th- and that's why we have the Bill of Rights that we have in this country. That's why the Constitution, you know, the United States is still, like everything else, really a voluntary compact. Um, you know, you look at the Constitution and, you know, like the, the Fourth Amendment, people have a right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and, uh, you know, unreasonable uns- search and seizure, se- searches and seizures. And that, that cannot be violated, says the Constitution. Well, it can be violated if we have a tyrant um, running the executive branch who decides to just violate it, mm-hmm. and we have enough police officers to go there and go ahead and do it. Right. Um, you know, that's why the Bill of Rights is is a list of of things that the government cannot do to you because you have these rights already as a human being. You, you recognize the the sovereignty of the individual mm-hmm. to be free from oppression from the group and the group being represented by the government. When you deviate from that and start making a list of things the government m- must give to you, you're not that very far away, because that government now has the power to do what it's done to humanity for almost all of its existence, which is oppression and slavery and death. And so when you start allowing a government to provide things and call them rights, that's the road you are in. You end up going down. That is not hyperbole. That is historical fact, no. and that's why the, the United States is is very different. And Bernie Sanders' bill of new Bill of Rights, whatever that is, is a is it at its basis level really a totalitarian government or a document not very much unlike the Soviet uh, Constitution, which of course was the greatest totalitarian government of the 20th century. <laughs> right. All right, uh, gentlemen, that will do it for today. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Tune in next week for a new episode of the In the Tank podcast. If you like our show, please subscribe, write a review for us on iTunes. You can also find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, pretty much everything nowadays. If you'd like, you can follow us on Twitter at In the Tank Pod. If you have a comment, suggestion, question, anecdote, joke, feel free to email us at In the Tank Podcast at gmail.com. Justin, where can the fine people find you? At Justin T. Haskins on Facebook and Twitter. Look for the big, beautiful blue check. That's right. And Jim, <laughs> where can the fine people find you? Uh, they can find me at J. Lakely on Twitter. And also, Bill de Blasi was out, and Andy is in big oh, trouble. Oh, my God. How do we not talk about that? I know. Oh, my gosh. We'll have to give everyone a full update next week. But, yes, last place, Andy. Uh, three people in a row have dropped out for his survivor pool. We'll try to post something on Twitter. How about that? All right. All right. So long. Thank you. Talk to you next week.